Good morning. Good morning. Let us uh, bow our heads in prayer. Search our hearts and know our ways. Make us better and never bitter, more fit for the journey. Forgive us for our sins, for there are many, and the foolishness of our ways. Somehow touch our hearts deep within and search our souls. We thank you for this reunion, for this moment, for this institution, for this leadership, for this body of experience. Repel us forward to do thy sacred will. Amen. I want to thank Gary for giving all the information I had forgotten. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> uh, our seminary oftentimes is dwarfed by union in um, projected image, in part because it's in New York. But this is the school. Dr. King got his first honorary degree from Chicago Theological Seminary. As Gary indicated, the tall white man next to the Jewish rabbis and the Greek and Protestant leaders in that picture coming in the cell was Dr. Shoma, our president, who at the time was a bona fide, conscience, objective, peace activist himself. Uh, I took my first trip to South Africa in 1979, led by Dr. Shoma, we were able to work with the council churches and, and the South African council churches. We did get into South Africa at that time to meet uh, Mandela's family. Many of Dr. King's urban pronouncements were made from the Chicago Theological Seminary. He expanded his efforts for peace at Ida Noyes Hall across the street from our school. And of course, his economic movement, which he referred to in his last uh, speech in Memphis, Tennessee, April 3rd, 1968. So deep in the heart of our struggle and many activities really spun around CTS. I do want to say that uh, I can be tweeted at Rev. J. Jackson. Uh, like me on Facebook, Rev. J. S. L. Jackson. <laughs> Rev. J. S. L. Jackson, Instagram. <laughs> you must know about how much I know about how much I know about that. <laughs> As I meet so many of my classmates before sharing some points I've written down, and I want to thank this uh, amazing new president that we have. She has done so much so well. She is a builder. Uh, builder of people. She is a grassroots sister from the deep south. She's inclined to a turnip greens, cornbread, <laughs> fried corn, pork chops, lemonade, potato pie. So she's very grounded. <laughs> I had to do that, Dallas. <laughs> In many ways, I, I, I would say I was um, born again, I made anew at Chicago Theological Seminary so different from my basic orientation. Uh, we may have the vision for the forest. We still have to cut down trees to get to the end. Uh, and as you cut down trees and create trails and then paths, um, a lot of treacherous spots and dark spots along the way but it's good to have the bigger vision. But in one sense, having a vision of being creative in your imagination is cost and risk-free. 
is cutting down the trees to get from where you are to some end zone. I suppose the most significant thing I learned while in this debate with Ron Fujiyoshi from Japan and another classmate from South Africa and people from around the world, uh, I really came here as a southerner from the South, Baptist, with Jesus uh, in my pocket. He followed me wherever I went. But I left here following him. <laughs> and Jesus in my pocket means he goes where I go. And that may not be acceptable. There's no risk in Jesus following us. Risk in us following Jesus. It's easier to admire him than to follow him. <laughs> Fifty years ago, I was a student at, at this school. I'm so proud of it. In school where our classmates, it's classmates stand again, our reunion class, those who went to Selma, stand again. <laughs> we were finding our way through, and as uh, Gary suggested, uh, I call myself coming to seminary. I was inclined to go to law school at Duke or maybe seminary. Dr. Proctor might have a dean more. Thought that would not be the best venue for me, that seminary education was so much broader than legal education, which I couldn't imagine because I had heard preachers who were so limited by comparison in their views and lawyers who argued that case to bail us out. But Dr. Proctor made the case that a sound seminary education covers far more zones than, than the law. And if I went to school in Duke, I had been so involved in the struggle there. I went to jail uh, June, uh, July 16, 1960, trying to use a public library. And then again in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, I was so involved, perhaps I would not do well academically, so I kind of came away from that scene. Uh, and. And this was away from that scene, on to meet new challenges and to meet new people who had such a profound impact upon my life. Selma, I'm not sure that we went to Selma with the understanding of the context as much as we were following the moment. We must see as a baseline, slavery, 200, 246 years of legal slavery, the sin of our soul. Uh, and for a moment, there was a, a war in which the South, the, the nation was savage and slavery ended as a matter of law, but not as a matter of culture. And there was some brief reprieve called Reconstruction, and then the troops were removed. It may have been a worse season uh, between uh, Reconstruction and 1950 than slavery. <coughs> Because at least in slavery, we were the property of the slave owners. They had some interest in protecting their slaves. Uh, but when the right to vote came in 1870, uh, we got some freedom. The minority slave owners became the majority of power. Slave owners became the minority of voters. So all of a sudden, slave masters had to go to the whims of the law. There were more slave, slaves than there were slave owners. And of course, there was great resentment over that new found power. But they used their infrastructure and their legacy of strength over through that season. Most of us pick up on Emmett Till around 1955. Between 1880 and 1950, there were more than 4,000 lynchings. We're not discussing um, people who were tried and prosecuted and condemned to die. 4,000 lynchings, most of which were after church on Sunday. They were lynching parties uh, in downtown courtrooms. And there's no that where they hung people out in the public square and used them for target practice. 
It is thought often that many blacks came north looking for a job. Many blacks came north as refugees, driven out of majority positions in the southern states. 1870, uh, after 246 years of slavery, uh, 251, 1870. The problem was we left the slave masters in charge of implementing the system. We left the slave masters in charge of, of implementing the right to vote. And they used all these devious schemes to deny the right to vote. And once they were able to engage in lynching without reservations, once the troops were removed, we find ourselves 95 years later going to Selma. If one looks at the movie, the tendency is to Dr. King negotiate with Lyndon Johnson, Dr. King emerges as the hero, Johnson as the villain, and then it ends up on glory going across the bridge. That's a very misleading imagery. There were kind of three forces at work, all of which mattered very much. It was the litigation of Thurgood Marshall, because from 1896 to 1954, apartheid was legal as a matter of a, of a system of law. When I grew up in Greenville, South Carolina, my father, a World War II vet, had to sit behind knots of POWs on American military bases. I was born in the house because we, the colored room of the hospital was full. Had to be born in, in the bedroom. Uh, we couldn't use a single public toilet. Uh, our money was counterfeited. We couldn't rent a room at Holiday Inn. We couldn't buy ice cream at Howard Johnson. We literally had no right that the white system was bound to respect. And so after that, they won that. So to at least make that the general state of relationships illegal, that was the Thurgood Marshall layer, which laid the groundwork after all when Mrs. Parks I talked with her about it. She and her attorney, Fred Gray, used to meet every Wednesday. How do we test the validity of the 54 decision? Is it real? It does not yet apply to Montgomery. So her going to, her sitting down one day was a plan. There was not this washerwoman with tired old feet who kind of sat down one day and she couldn't work no longer. She was a literacy teacher. She was an NAACP field organizer. She knew Mrs. Um, Boynton uh, in uh, Selma, who used to be visited by Booker Washington and his, and his wife and, and family. And so she planned to sit in to test the case. And while the 50, while the 65 voter rights act was, I mean, the, the 55 uh, boycott was significant, what made it, if, if they had won the 55 boycott because they, bought, because they bankrupted the bus system, it would only apply to Montgomery. But in 56, they passed a law to validate the 54 decision in all public accommodation denials. So Montgomery triggered uh, the focus on the 1954 bill. And by 56, they won the lawsuit. So whether you were in Birmingham or Greenville or Atlanta or Miami, you had the right to use public facilities. But the, the lead of that really was Thurgood Marshall. In the middle of that, Dr. King emerged as a local leader in town, detail, 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 uh, and became the symbol of nonviolent, disciplined action, mass action. There was even some tension between those who had won battles incrementally along litigation. What does all this masses have to do with it? There was some tension because it was a transition from litigation to demonstration as we used to sit back and wait for a few lawyers to go to court and hope that they would win the case, often against all white juries, always against all white juries, and sometimes with, with a, some sensitive judge. But the shift from lawyers in a courtroom to mass action in pulpits was in part of, the, part of that sweep. It took litigation of led by Johnson, I mean by Dr. Thurgood Marshall, 
and demonstration led by Dr. King, and litigation and, and, and legislation led by Lyndon Johnson. It is a mistake to diminish Lyndon Johnson's role in this. If Goldwater had won the 64 election, we'd have a different outcome. This would have further emboldened George Wallace. The Southern culture was so deep in this race business. I visited George Wallace one time before he died and uh, just talked with him and had prayer with him. He was open to it. And we developed some camaraderie. And I said, George, we just talk about different things. He had more blacks in his cabinet at that time than any other Southern state did. He was working on his redemption process and <laughs> trying to build relationships. He really was sincere about it. So I said, but George, tell me about the bridge that said, I knew, I knew you were going to say something about that, Jess. I knew you were going to say something about that. <laughs> I said, he said, well, actually, I did the march as a favor. I said, you really got to explain that. <laughs> he said, on the other side of the bridge was this mob. And if, if they had gone across the bridge, the mob would have beat them. So I, I had to stop them with, with the horses. It never occurred to him to break up the mob. <laughs> but to beat the marchers. Of course, in his Confederate mind, he could not conceive of the military being unleashed on the mob. That's what makes Forbes's issue such a big deal in Little Rock. I mean, the idea of the federal government, or not to mention a state government, moving in on the mob, which in fact had control law through the politics of lynching. So we must put in perspective litigation, demonstration, legislation. Out of Johnson comes public accommodation bill, right to vote, fair housing, Medicaid, Medicare, breakfast treatment program, Abolition, regional council, open housing, more scholarships, poverty from 34% down to 18%. Sidetracked by a war he didn't start. Wars are easier to start than to end. He didn't know how to stop it. He didn't start it. President Barack Obama pulled out of Iraq, but the war is not over. After Iraq, there's, you know, there's Middle East. After Iraq, there's Libya. And so it's easier to start them than to stop them but he is forever painted with the face of the war. But one must never, the good that we do should not be lost. Only Lincoln stands as tall as Lyndon Johnson as a profound change agent. He passed virtually 200 pieces of social legislation. Kennedy could not have done it. No one else ever did it. And today one might argue President Barack Obama may be the the most endangered president since Lincoln and Kennedy, and the most hated and resented since Lyndon Johnson, who was seen as betraying the South. I mean, a the South going sh sharp power, but the real conversation was when Dr. King, one of the meetings with, with Lyndon Johnson, he said that we need the right to vote. He said, well, you can't do this. I, 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 I would if I, if I could. I can't give it unilaterally. And the Congress could if they would, and they won't. But if you get it, you'll lose the South for another 40 to 50 years because the South is controlled by Jefferson Davis Democrats. And when we got the right to vote, Jefferson Davis Democrats became Goldwater Reagan Republicans. And Lincoln Republicans became Kennedy Johnson Democrats. That's where the big switch took place right after. Johnson was the last president to win the majority of white Southern votes. That was just a lag time uh, between Reagan going to Philadelphia, Mississippi, where Swinnigan and Cheney were killed, making the case we're back, where the Klan actually endorsed him in their, uh, in, in their paraphernalia. Beyond Selma, beyond that bridge, we think of it as blacks finally getting the right to vote. Blacks got the promise made after 246 years of slavery, and really 251, 1870. Blacks couldn't vote. White women couldn't serve on juries. 
18 years couldn't vote, those serving in Vietnam. You couldn't vote on college campuses. It's part of the shootout at, at Kent State. You could not vote bilingually. You couldn't get delegate votes proportionally. That came out of our 88 campaign. In 84, when we were working, we got far more de votes than delegates. We don't understand we had several million more votes on about 400 delegates. It was that if, if I get 47%, someone else gets 50.1, they did all the delegates, want to take all, just rule manipulation. So we made the case if you get 47% of the votes, you get 47% of the delegates. That seemed to be of no value in 88, but in 08 when President Barack ran against uh, Hillary Clinton, she actually gave him momentum won California, but barely, but she won it. She won Texas, she won Ohio, and Pennsylvania. Under the 84 rule, she would have been the winner. We want to take all in Texas, California, Ohio. But on the 88 rules, a part of our, of our own democratizing democracy, President Barack became the winner. Now watch this. When the victory came in 08, we were in the same Grant Park where we'd been gassed 40 years before in 68. Same park. That's why it was such a, a tearful night for me to think about the gas that night over against the victory that night was that it was not so much that we were young race, but the new voters, the democratizing of Selma, beat the old hardliners. They, they didn't change. The red states remained red. What was different was as a whole body of voters, black voters and women voters and 18-year-old voters and soldiers and college students on campuses and proportionality and by a new generation of a kind of rainbow coalition, a kind of multiracial thrust that comes out of Selma. We often reduce it just to uh, the black part of it. So beyond his going across the bridge was 25 years of, of struggle where we had the right to vote, but we couldn't win because of gerrymandering and annexation at large and rule purging schemes. But one has to ask Watchman, what time is it? Because what's confusing if you don't get into some of this detail is there was a big celebration in Selma two months ago. It should have been a big demonstration, yeah. a big protest. Because the victory won in Selma in August of 65 was nullified in Shelby in June 13, 19, uh, 2013. What made the vote different in 1965, we, we put the troops back, except the troops were section four and section five. You, you could not, those areas that had shown patterns of segregation were under federal observation on the federal oversight, as opposed to military soldiers, it was simply the legislation. The Department of Justice had to, had to approve any, any pre-clearance pre deal. And so with that in place, with the Section 4 and Section 5, we began to win city council races and congressional races and state races and blacks and whites needing each other. If I got my man did have 55% black and 45% white. We kind of need each other. Because if, if, I, if I don't do the right thing, there's enough of you to, to defeat me or enough of you to assist me. But we, we shared power. In, 19, in 2013, when Roberts and Clarence Thomas moved Section 4 out, they removed the troops again. And therefore, states' rights is back in full force. That means that they have the power to draw the lines. So the Supreme Court victory a few weeks ago called against stacking and packing. They're still stacking if not packing. And what that means is that if they can put 80% blacks in one district and 80% whites in one district, you can win your ghetto, but you, you lose the influence vote. And so the 80 becomes a white primary again. It becomes a white 
majority all over again. Uh, and therefore they can pass laws that, that fit their fears. And those whites who are progressive can't win because fear becomes the order of the day. So what, there are no more white Democrats in the South because they cannot stand the winds of fear. Now let me put this another way. Alabama, where, where it all began. The last slave ship landed Clotilde in Mobile, Alabama. The Confederacy, the White House in Montgomery, Alabama, had their own currency, their own government, Montgomery, Alabama. A block from that White House was Dr. King's church. It's amazing how, how that, that circle comes. And then the voting rights at Birmingham, Alabama, Selma, Alabama. Now Shelby, Alabama. Shelby is this generation's bridge. We, we won but lost the Selma victory. We lost the Selma victory. The troops have been removed. The oversight has been removed. They can now, you can win, they can draw you out with the lines because they control the, the process uh, uh, of, uh, of determining who, who can win. So let's go a, a step further because in this new stage, the reason why it puts a particular burden upon our white brothers and sisters here dealing with this issue of fear in politics. Alabama's turned down $10 billion over Medicaid. They don't want federal money. They want federal money for education. So they, they accept $200 million from a, from a Department of Education grant, but use it to fill up, they use it to fortify the jails. 25% population, African American, prisons, 75%. Prisons for profit, private prisons, prison labor. There are some youth over here in Cook County Jail been there from six months to six years on pretrial detention. Only to get to court and they've been in jail longer than the time was called for. That's this day our daily bread. Which, uh, and so the 240 Alabamians who lost the right to vote because they've been to prison, but 180 African Americans. So then they're taking away the right to vote by, with the scheme of prisons, ex-convicts, ex ex-prisons cannot vote. That's enough votes to determine the outcome in, Senate, in, in state elections. Enough votes to determine state legislative and, and, and city council and mayoral races. So the Voting Rights Act of 65 was, has been defeated. We should have been protesting Shelby not letting the governor of Alabama put on a performance, but how good Alabama has become. South Carolina, where I'm from, they've turned back $12 billion in Medicaid money. They don't want federal money. They want federal money for highways. They want federal money for, for airports and seaports. They want federal money for recreation. They want federal money for bridges, but not for the poor. This kind of anti-poor mania, uh, uh, of which blacks often are disproportionate. But whether black or white, it is the basis for a renewed coalition on the next stage of our struggle, this issue of access. What also struck me in Selma, good to see you there, Dr. Hunt, was <laughs> while there was a celebration about the victory that was and ignoring the victory that, that ignoring the defeat that had occurred just about 60 miles up the road in, in the Shelby case, is that Mrs. Boynton, Mrs. Boynton was to Selma what Rosa Parks was to Montgomery. She wrote a letter to Dr. King about why he had to come to Alabama to deal with the voting issue. She drove, she and Attorney Fred Gray, from her home to Dr. King's home on Christmas Day of 6 to 4, and they didn't think it could happen. Dr. King didn't at that time. And she finally convinced him to come and do a mass meeting. He had begun to come in at the Christmas of 64. There's a letter in the, uh, 
museum along the highway between Selma and Alabama that she wrote to Dr. King, Mrs. Amelia Boynton. When we went to visit uh, Selma in 65, and I was with CT, some miraculous things happened. One of them was that we went straight to CT Vivian, who was kind of our um, person there. And uh, he had been hit in the mouth a few days before. Him, a kind of symbolic, really a blow for freedom. We came out the side of the church, and we saw the sheriffs going down the street. So we jumped in the car, and we turned right, and we turned up in the project. So I saw an open door. I said, CT, um, let's run in this house very fast. So I jumped out and ran in the house. And the lady came down, and she said, uh, who are you? I said, we were Dr. King. She said, are you sure? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, can I trust you? I said, yes, ma'am. And I told CT, he came in. I said, well, let's have prayer. She said, you were, y'all were Dr. King? We said, yes, ma'am. She said, now, I wash his rice. And them guys, this is when James Reeve got beaten. Uh, that guy with that collar on came in, and them men who eat there all the time, they followed him. And they came back with blood on their stick, bragging about what they had done. So when the FBI asked our boss, does he know anything, he said, no, he'd be lying. So please tell Dr. King that, but please don't put my name in it. We left that house, it just happened to run in that house, of all the houses in that house, and we went to Miss Boynton's house where Dr. King was staying, because uh, you couldn't stay in the hotels there, reading, if you will, his Bible, Love, Power, and Justice, and Nebo's Man, Nature and Destiny of Man, with books littered by, by his side at that time. Mrs. Boynton, who was this huge figure, she was beaten that Sunday that, that John Lewis and Jose was beaten. That's an iconic picture of her being beaten with a dress all pulled up because they'd beat her almost unconsciousness. Her house is now condemned. Houses down that street today uh, have, still have indoor toilets, outdoor toilets. Ja- Dallas County, the home of the Voting Rights Act, is 40 plus percent unemployment, p- poverty, and poverty. So everybody, the politicians, going, we think Selma because Selma did this for us. If it hadn't been Selma, we, we couldn't be in the Congress. We couldn't be in the White House. Well, Selma did a lot for us. We've done, done, done much for Selma. Because yeah. Lyndon Johnson said if you have the right to vote and don't have a war on poverty, it's incomplete. To have the right to vote without the access to health care, job, and education it does not quite complete the deal. That's why Johnson in his thinking was so complete. One must read at least three or four of Johnson's speeches, one being Howard University, one being University of Michigan. There are about four of them. Johnson deserves a class to be studied. We've had no president other than Lincoln, and Lincoln gets the credit because of the Civil War and abolishing slavery as a matter of, as a matter, a matter of law with the 13th Amendment. But none has compared <coughs> to Lyndon Johnson. In terms of concrete, Medicaid, Johnson. Medicare, Johnson. Strengthening Social Security, Johnson. Breakfast feeding programs, all that's done to Johnson. And so no movie should diminish his role as a fundamental use of his power as a president who knew how to maneuver the system to make things happen. Last of this issue, today we're free but not equal. Say free, free. but not equal. After 246 years of slavery, they say now slavery is over. You are free. But the 246 years of infrastructural development, schools and engineering and highways and hospitals and philosophers and schools and universities, you walk away. And Johnson said if you walk away free with with the chains off and know where to go, you're still 246 years behind. Slave masters maintained the infrastructure. So even all the federal money that came south was spent by the slave masters. A lot of people that see a fight for reparations, the reason it's hard to get reparations, hard is because slave masters got the reparations. They got paid to let us go. The federal government paid the slave masters to let the enslaved go free. But whatever advantage you have in two and a half centuries, all the advantages were maintained. Y'all with me so far? Yeah. Segregation. We finally won that battle, Ivy. But all the advantages of slavery and segregation, the, so effort and excellence are important. Inheritance and access are more important. Say so effort, effort and excellence, excellence matters. matters. Inheritance, Inheritance and access, access 
but there's more. The laws of perpetuity are on this side. So there are, two, there are 20,000 auto dealerships today, uh, 20, 246 African Americans. Because those who had the dealerships when they first started giving out dealerships are all white, and they get them to maintain perpetuity. There's not one black soft drink franchise in America today. Not one Coke, not one Pepsi, not one anything. So highway construction, engineering. We went out to Silicon Valley a few months ago, and we over-indexed almost all the comp all, all, almost all the comp companies. 189 board members, 36 white women, three blacks, one Latino. C-suites, 367 in the C-suites. Three blacks, three Latinos. Employment around a consistent 2%. Investment startups almost does not exist. Now, techniques that we learned at this seminary, how to negotiate, how to leverage. We retook Niebuhr seriously. How to negotiate, how to leverage. Use of breadbasket skills on getting stores open here in Chicago. Those skills learned here is what is now happening in Silicon Valley. The Saturday morning meeting we've had every Saturday since 1966 started in McGifford Hall. It says that the urban dynamic, in fact, was successful. When a guy like Taylor says that Dr. King came to Chicago and failed, that's not true. Unlike those one-horse towns, we can have a, a kind of one-horse victory. Chicago is far more complex. And so there's, there's a direct line from the 66 open housing margin in Chicago the Harold's Victory in 83. The line from Harold's Victory in 83 to my running in 84 and 88. The line from that to Carol Moses Brown in 1990. The line from that to Barack Obama in 2008. All this comes out of Chicago. Out of CTS, if, no less. Because we were in vigorous debate, not just about piety, but about power. If there is one heresy in our church today that stands out to me as it is, the Jesus of clasps hands and piety, looking pitiful and talking to yourself. <laughs> Jesus was not killed for clasp hands. <laughs> and looking sanctimonious. He could have done that until he just got tired of doing that. He was a minority. A Jewish minority born on the church or religious corruption and government occupation, born under a death warrant, under controversy about who his daddy was. His earthly daddy didn't believe what the story was. Goes to Egypt as a refugee, coming from the poor section called Nazareth and Galilee, and never left how you, how you redefine man. It's about how much you got or how much you care. That was the revolution. People care that you know, but they must know that you care. Here comes this revolution that you are measured by how you treat the least of these. <laughs> the widow's might means more to me than the big church donor. What are you talking about? I was hungry and you fed me. Naked and you clothed me. Challenging big church corruption and, 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 and greed and challenging oppressive government. That's what got them killed, you know. And that's why these people wearing these gold crosses with the diamonds on them is a heresy. <laughs> this is a rugged proposition. And, 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 and it is not by convenience without sacrifice the change. It's by risk. We, Gary mentioned we, Burford, we're coming up to the highway. Uh, and we had to run, go real fast because they were killing white people. Uh, this in the car with an out-of-town license plate faced the risk of death. We went knowing that we might not come back. There was a risk involved. There was a sacrifice involved. And to be going on with the out-of-state tag with black and white in the same car had to be going to Selma to be involved in meddling in that situation. <laughs> Last to Chicago today, 50 years later. We are free but not equal. 
One Chicago, Inglewood, and Roseland, 30% unemployment. Northside, institutional infrastructure, 3% unemployment. Suburb jobs on its signs. In the city today, close fit to public schools, fit to drug stores, 75 grocery stores. No trauma units, but there is trauma, and many trauma units, but there is no trauma. Poverty abounds. And for those persons, there is a safety net called jails. It seems to me that we must now lift our sights above the daily pain. Cut trees and look at forests. Use our sights to imagine a new heaven and a new earth. The old one has passed away. We must fight for a voting rights act that's constitutionally founded beyond just, just registering the vote. We must fight to wipe out hunger and not wipe out the hungry. That's a budgetary struggle. We must fight for Medicaid to be broadly applied to these sick people who want uh, affordable care but don't want Obamacare. <laughs> want an omelet but don't want the eggs. We must lift our sight above. We cannot adjust to homelessness. We either adjust or we resent or we resist. Say adjust, adjust. Resent, resent, or resist. Or resist. We cannot adjust to poverty, abounding, because God has with the stripping genius among the poorest among us. The athletes among us, the artists among us, he has a way. And so I would say as we think about a, a, a plan for urban reconstruction, where's the money? Well, we got about 10 trillion offshore tax money that's not coming back into culture because it costs too much to bring the profits back. That's the fight of our time. We must wipe out poverty. We must end the violence, hatred, and the fear. We face a headwind, and yet we must journey on. It's true that the arc of the universe is long, but you must bend it. It makes sense to me to make the case of my people who are called by my name to follow, not to admire me, will humble themselves enough to take risks and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear their prayer heal their land. Thank you very much.